The makers of the RX 580 Cute Pet are back, and this time it's with the Yeston RX 7900XTX Sakura Sugar. It is a $1,070 or so dollar card, so it's about 70 bucks over the original MSRP of the 7900XTX. And this card is one part Synthwave Cyberpunk with the quality and colorful print on a high gloss shroud, combined with a stylized backplate that has some odd choices for text, and it's one part waifu because of the waifu. But they didn't go too overboard with the anime fan service this time because the card actually is mostly well built. We had some complaints about it, you'll hear about those in this review today, but for the most part it's built like a legitimate card. And as sort of a bonus for this one, it might even be something you can put in your gaming PC and not have to hide out of embarrassment when the Uber driver comes by to drop off food. So, what? They're not, they're not off limits, they roast me all the time. Audience roasting aside, today we're benchmarking and tearing down Yeston's completely unique entry to the RX 7900 XDX family, the Sakura Sugar. Before that, this video is brought to you by Lee & Lee's Lancool 3 case. The Lancool 3 has a fully mesh front, good airflow that did well on our thermal testing earlier this year, and it's one of the most mechanically advanced cases we've ever reviewed. The Lancool 3 balances ease of installation features, thermal performance, and cable management in a competitive case market. Learn more at the link in the description below. So to get you caught up to speed quickly, Yeston first landed on our radar back in 2019. That's when they launched the RX 580 Cute Pet. It's a card we bought from AliExpress. They mostly sell to the Chinese market, and uh, we hadn't heard of them before, or at least had ever worked with them before this card. We found this card to be so almost charmingly reasonably built that we then went in pursuit of their other product to see if it was a mistake or not. Because this, we bought zero contact with Yeston and first time working with it. Uh, so that brought us to the Cute Pet case. And that case became popular enough after our video that people were emailing us asking us how to even buy one. It was a micro ATX box. It's, I think, still sold. And it's got pretty high quality machining, highly competitive build quality, and obviously a unique look. Now, this time, Yeston reached out to us. We said, yes, we would like one to review, like we've done in the past with that card. And we're doing the full teardown, thermals, attaching thermocouples all over the board. We're treating it just like any other serious product. Because even though, yes, these are highly memeable and video friendly, they're actually kind of legit too. And the main point that we like to make every time we look at a, a quote unquote weird product like one of these is that this is cool because the custom stuff is not commonly seen. Normally, video cards are black and red gamer branded product. And that gets kind of boring. So if a company can keep all of the actual functional aspects of it, but make it look different, add some unique tooling for the shroud or whatever, that just makes it more interesting to build computers. And hopefully Asus and Gigabyte and MSI and all of them kind of jump on board too. The card is clearly marketed on the visuals first. We're going to talk about the aesthetics of it as objectively as we can, and you can make your own decisions on it. And then we'll start going through the thermals and the actual build quality of it. So starting with the card walk around, the cooling solution uses three 100 millimeter fans. Each of them has a different color and they have a surrounding LED ring that illuminates the fan body and housing. It includes a large fin stack that extends past the PCB, which is a modern design trope, but they've blocked off the flow through area. So this is a hit to the thermal efficiency for more visuals. Blocked off and replaced with an LED illuminated avatar. Unfortunately, Yeston cuts the cooler shroud plastic soon enough that air can still exit the vertically oriented fins at the top and bottom of the card without being trapped by anything more than they normally would be. Strictly from a design standpoint, the cooler shroud is a large piece of plastic with ridge line texturing sort of all around it. The front is a glossy and reflective finish with purple, blue, and pink coloring. As for the back plate, it's a little bit weird. The card has some more legible text like the giant game start block. We're not sure what that's a reference to. It also has some less readable text like what appears to be either a bad font or a somewhat faked language reading things like file EDN and Lodwin. It's unique in this regard too. The card appears to have a somewhat standard thermal design. We'll test that soon. And with that customization comes some, again, unique marketing. First of all, it's very important that you're up to speed on the Yeston lore. And fortunately, they've included a manual for that. So inside of the box that is very NVIDIA 
40 series inspired, as you can see. Uh, there is a hand, or well, maybe not hand drawn, but there's a comic. And uh, sorry, is that the right word? Is it a is it a is it a mon I, I don't know. I don't know this stuff. I review computer parts. Uh, so anyway, they have a manual. If you can read it, they explain the backstory to all the characters. We're not going to review the story for the video card, but the point is, someone cares a lot and put a lot of time into it. What you need to know is that the recurring character is Wan Wan, who is the dog-cat sort of mascot that you see on this card. He can turn into a very aggressive dog uh, that's like a, a semi... Maybe it's like a demigod dog? I, I don't A demi-dog? I don't know. The point is, as you can see, if we just read through my slides here from Yeston's website, there's a lot of marketing, and it says a lot of things. The website's written in Chinese, but the marketing is just as silly in native Mandarin as it is in English. For example, it says the character that the video card is based on is named Hitomi Sakura. It nicknames the character Tangguo Tianqin, or something like basically candy sweetheart. Confusingly, it also states routine di hua da tang, or basically invasion plan accomplished. Uh, but credit for the effort. This is related to the backstory for all the characters, including demons that they depict on cards as well, but we haven't gotten one of those yet, even though we actually really want to look at one. The marketing gets really into the lore. It describes the cooling system, for example, as the sugar cooling system. And naturally, Sakura Hitomi wears the sugar cooling system. Now, to be fair, it doesn't look like there's much to be worn, but uh, that's what it's called. And finally, poetically, it states, uh, in, translated into English, it states, the wind from the sea will blow away the heat. So, uh, for some reason, the backstory is beach themed. We're not sure why, but I have some ideas. Uh, I think they thought it would sell more video cards. On the technical side, Yeston points out a 14 layer PCB and a 20 phase VRM with dual BIOS. These are things we can actually test. We don't have the means to test the efficacy of candy sweetheart invasion plans or sugar cooling, but we can test VRMs. It also brags about an eight heat pipe design going on the heftier side for a GPU cooler. This thing is looks focused, but again, it's actually a real video card. It's not just a meme, and they don't put all the characters and the story for the most part on the card itself. It's just basically a blue, pink, and purple card with a black backplate and sort of an outline of a character, but it doesn't go too heavy there, which is nice because it blends some sort of normal designs for a video card with something unique without going too overboard. All right, let's get started with some testing. We'll start with thermals. And, and I need to explain how we do that first. So for thermal testing, what we do first is a pass without ever disassembling it, and then we pull it apart, attach K-type thermal couples typically, and they're calibrated, so we know the difference between all of them. You could use a thermal camera like this one. These have excellent uses. This is not one of them, because you have to alter the card by like pulling off the backlight, for example, to get a meaningful read on the back of the hot component, and then you're changing how it behaves and it doesn't show you the front side at all because there's a cooler attached to them. You also can use thermocouple readers like this old one that has relays in it. This actually works great even though it's old technology. We bought it, we fixed it, and now if we want to use it uh, for something different we can. You can also use smaller handheld ones like this. And for validation we use a laser tachometer to test for uh, the fan speed to make sure the reading we get in software is correct. So that's the basics. All this is wired up very carefully internally. That's kind of the hard part and the part that uh, is not worth talking about since it's unlikely many of you would be doing that. Uh, that's how we do it. And we maintain a steady 21C for all the tests. Okay, time for charts. So the first test is conducted prior to ever disassembling the card, which means there is zero interference. This is straight out of the box. That means that the thermocouples weren't installed until the next test. The first chart plots the temperature with the default V BIOS and its default fan curve. The GPU ramped quickly to a steady state of 54 degrees Celsius. The core temperature here is actually great. 
but we'll need to factor in noise to know how it is in total because it's not impressive to be 54 degrees if you're screaming loud, and we'll look at that later. There's one immediate downside though. The hot spot climbs to about 80 degrees, posting a massive delta of 30 degrees against the core average. 30 degrees is enough that when run in a hotter environment, the GPU will clip frequency and potentially drop some clocks as a result of just the hotspot temperature alone. This is a mix of bad distribution of hardware to mount the cooler to the PCB and possibly of uneven mounting pressure. We discovered later that there aren't any springs to help secure the four primary screws with adequate pressure. We'll look at that in the teardown in a moment. And we'd attribute some of this delta to that oversight. But AMD's GPU hotspot doesn't really start to throttle hard until 110 degrees, so there's still some room here. Now the last line on the plot is for fan speed. This plots at about 1900 RPM under these stock conditions. That's on the higher side for a three fan cooler and anecdotally, we observed that the noise is louder relative to other GPU coolers we've worked with lately. But we don't need anecdotes here. We have numbers. Here's the chart with noise levels. RPM is plotted at the bottom and perceived volume in DBA is on the left axis. Idle, the card produces effectively zero noise, that's not plotted here, and that's because the fans don't spin. It has a zero RPM mode. We noticed an RPM ranging approximately 1800 to 1900 during steady state load. That had the meter at 47 dBA in our standardized conditions. There was no coil wind to speak of, at least compared to the reference card on this one. That can also be unit to unit though. But 47 dBA, regardless, is on the louder side. And for point of reference, we'll just put an AMD reference cooler's auto noise levels during the same workload here, so it's a like for like. So as you can see, AMD is ran at about 42.2 dBA under identical conditions, plotting at about 1700 RPM for its fan speed. AMD's card ran 10 degrees warmer on average for the core, but the same for hotspot, keeping in mind that ours didn't have the vapor chamber defect or whatever it ended up being that some people ran into for the reference model. So the two could meet somewhere in the middle and still be in a good position with the Yeston card running quieter as a result or the AMD card just running cooler and a little bit louder. Back to thermals, but now with thermocouples. With the Sakura card, we plotted a 55 degree average for the GPU core, 80 degrees for the hotspot, and we measured the two MOSFETs we chose at 59 degrees and 54 degrees Celsius. These are better than most cards, so all that air is definitely working, even if it's a bit louder as a result. The real takeaway here is that Yeston has a ton of room to decrease the fan noise and the fan speed for quality of life while really not sacrifice anything relevant thermally. These MOSFETs are at least 50 degrees under spec. Now, we don't want them to run at spec, that's bad, but uh, you've still got up until at least the 80s where it's very comfortable to run these things. So there's plenty of room up until that point and there won't be major derating once you hit 80, for example. The GPU hotspot is the real problem and likely the actual reason they're running the vBIOS fan curve so hard. As for memory, the main module we measured plotted at 52 degrees, the secondary module ran at 46 degrees, but the secondary module was one with good contact to the cooler, more distance from the hot VRM, and access to airflow. All of these numbers are well within spec. We didn't measure every memory module. The time commitment would have been massive, like a day, just to wire the memory if we did that. But we always try to choose an expected hotspot and an expected average. The numbers look good so far. Compared to reference, the GPU core is cooler and the hotspot's about the same. The reference delta here, uh, core to hotspot, is only 14 degrees. Okay, so uh, four screws as usual for the GPU retention bracket. They could come out to a third slot right here but they capped it at two. But almost enough for three, and that extra slot would really help with rigidity. We're gonna start with the back plate screws. I'm gonna track those on the mod mat, which you can grab on store.gamersnexus.net. If you wanna work on a surface like the one I'm working on for tearing down your components, building your system, uh, they are highly heat resistant. If you wanna do some tube bending for water cooling, really good work surface for your builds, and it supports us. So far, these are all the same type of screw, which does make it a lot easier to put it back together. So I was hoping to just take the back plate off, but I see that there's going to be some top side screws, like those two right there, that go through the PCB on the top and into the back plate, which is holding it in place. So that means we need to take the cooler off before the back plate. Oh, they're not spring retained either. It's just screws uh, on the leaf spring, which is this thing but no spring on the screws. So maybe some cutting of corners there. It's not the most important thing in the world. It is nice though, because it helps to 
uh, create more of a spec for users who are maintaining their own products. OK, so we have all the screws out of the back side of the card. I think we're probably going to have to take the screws out of the I.O. plate now. OK, that plate can't come out yet, but it's at least not secured to the cooler anymore, which normally would mean I could just pull it right now. See that flex? It's trying to pull away. I don't know if it's just a lot of suction from thermal pads or if there's a screw somewhere. Yep. Okay. My instinct was right. It just uh, it required getting over some fears. Uh, a good idea. Oh, jeez. <laughs> it was real secure. So um, nothing was damaged. That is, in fact, how it's intended to come apart. This paste here is a phase change material. So uh, it is, I guess, in a purely technical sense, not a thermal paste, but it's actually a pad that you put on a GPU. Really common. We talked about these at length with NVIDIA, with Malcolm, in that interview. And uh, you can find that on the channel if you're curious. But basically, to make mass production easier, they put a single pad on that is pre-sized. It's a harder material, which you're seeing here, this, this hardened compound. It's not because the paste is dry. Uh, it is because it was uh, melted as the card was heated up initially. These two connect. So they've got all the fans connecting via this. And that's going to be for TAC, RPM, and LEDs, I think. So this is actually a really nice implementation of LEDs where you can see they've got a foil tape in there for reflective purposes. These two wires go into a tiny PCB. And they're just casting light side shot into the uh, into the plate. So that's, that's a, a simple but very effective way to do it. For memory modules, they've gone with four on the bottom. Now, memory in this bottom area normally runs a little bit warmer because it's right against the PCIe slot. So that's a potential downside, but I haven't yet really seen them outside of spec on at least these AMD cards. I haven't seen it out of spec in the past, but it's been a long time. Then they have the other four between the GPU and the VRM inductors. You've got more VRM over here, and then you have the rest of the memory up top. And then we also have these two switches. Very tiny text on there right here uh, just says LED underscore SW, so that's LED switch. And it just toggles on and off, very simple. Currently it's on. And this is going to be another switch for BIOS. So just two positions for that. It's been a, a while since we've taken apart the new XT and XTX GPUs, but as a reminder, they're chiplet-based, which, if we clean this off, so there's that harder phase change compound. I'll clean the rest of it before reassembly, but you can see enough now to remember the chiplet design. It's built the same way as the other packages we've taken apart. So you have the MCDs around the outside and then the GCD in the center. And we have a whole separate video explaining what all those letters mean. This is an insane amount of heat pipes. So they've gone with the quantity approach to heat pipes. And all six of those come straight down this giant fin stack. So it's fairly densely populated fin stack, uh, but simple design. They have a contact patch here for the MOSFETs. The inductors are not directly cooled, which is OK. They can run pretty hot. So those sit in here. They actually get cooled by air, which is, I mean, inductors can run like 125, 150 degrees Celsius, so air is, is sufficient with a good VRM design. And then we hit the cold plate, which is a nickel-plated copper cold plate to contact the GPU and the memory all in one piece. So they're sharing a cooling solution directly. And then you have the other half of the VRM cooled over here with MOSFET contact to the thermal pad contacting another plate. So it looks like for this one, they're not using a vapor chamber at all. It's all a heat pipe design. So that's a six mil heat pipe there. I mean, I think marketing would call that a, a solid six millimeters. <laughs> We're going to just quickly take the shroud off as well so we can see the rest of the fin stack. So I'm going to track screws on both sides of the silhouette here because uh, these are completely different screws. OK, there's the fin stack. And now you get a really clear, nice shot 
of all the heat pipes down in the middle. So this is a pretty, it's, it's a really overkill sort of brute force approach to design. It covers all the bases. They've got good contact to all the VRM components. The inductors are left with air cooling, which should be okay. So realistically, you're probably getting coverage from about like one, two, three, four, maybe five of these heat pipes get really good coverage across the GPU core. You could individually replace the fans, I guess, but you'd probably have trouble getting these exact colors. Last thing we're gonna do is just take the back plate off of this. Kind of a lot of screws. Okay, so they're not really leveraging the back plate here for anything other than, I guess, the art and maybe some rigidity, but uh, no contact from thermal pads to the board. It's okay as long as the design is good enough elsewhere. We'll see in thermal testing. I would say overall, this is a very solid design for something that is clearly uh, looks driven. They've actually built a real product, which is awesome. That's, that's something Yeston's been doing well with, where they've gone, hey, we can make things that look more interesting than black and red gaming card make it a little different, but still have the functionality. So uh, I'm pretty happy with how this came apart. Very easy to work on overall, other than the initial uh, scary amount of force required to, to, to part these two. But otherwise, it looks pretty good. Now for some power consumption testing. Here's the chart. The RX 7900 XTX stock card pulled 351 watts with the Reference V BIOS from AMD. AMD allows you to overclock that up to 416 watts without any modifications to the firmware. You just do it through the software power offset. The Yeston card pulls 358 when it's in the alternative V BIOS. We'd like to see more fine-tuned use of the V BIOS switch to also adjust the fan speed in step with these changes. Overclocking pushes it 17 to 18% higher, up to 422 watts. So for power profile, the Yeston card is about the same as the reference card. Now for a quick frequency comparison. Here, the Yeston card plotted at 2400 megahertz during the same thermal workload we ran earlier. That's lower than AMD's reference in the same test at 2500 to 2540. And the alternative VBIOS pushed it to about 2480 megahertz. So an 80 megahertz gain for eight watts extra on the Yeston card leads us to assume that this would have to do it with an adjustment within the VBIOS tables. And that extra couple watts helps too. It's still lower than reference though. Finally, for game testing, gaming results rarely change between the same model GPU on different partner cards. That's not where the partners add value. Partners add value in quality of life features like warranty support, noise levels, the look of it, and size, things like that. So don't expect big differences here. For this review, we are trimming it down to only 7900 XTXs and the XT. If you want all of the data, go check out our 4070 Ti review where you can compare it to other cards. So let's take a look at the results. This is tested on the default VBIOS. The first charts for Total War Warhammer 3, you'll notice a 7900 XTX entry with the brackets LTD or limited, meaning limited run. Uh, that means it's a brand new data set but that it's limited strictly to the games we're comparing in this review for the Yeston card. We left the original launch data as well. The reference card outperformed the Yeston model by two FPS average cleanly with absolutely no difference in lows. Even the average is close to error or run-to-run -run deviation here. It's a real swing as a result of the frequency gap, meaning this is a realized change from that line plot we saw a moment ago, but it's not a noticeable one to the user. At 4K, it's more of the same, 92 FPS average to 91.4 and lows identical. We relearn why, once again, it's important to review board partner cards for thermals, noise, taking them apart, build quality, maintainability or service quality, and other quality of life features, because there's definitely no difference in gaming performance, at least not with these two. Final Fantasy XIV is next. We're not bottlenecked by the CPU at 4K, so these are GPU-bound results. The AMD reference card maintains about a 3 FPS average lead here over the Eston model, which is expected when looking at the frequency delta. The original test data is within test variance as well. And F1 2022 at 1440p, there's no difference between them. The lows are remarkably consistent between the GPU entries, but that's more of a testament to our testing process and bench accuracy than anything else. Yes, that's a little bit self-congratulatory, but honestly, we deserve to take credit for that one because that level of consistency took years of small refinements to our processes to eliminate noise in the data. So it's worth just pointing out that, hey, these are super consistent and 
just from a nerdy data is cool perspective, that's really cool. Anyway, for Yestin, it's about the same as the reference model, so moving on. At 4K, the outcome is the same. There's slight uplift from the original launch driver, but otherwise, everything looks about the same. The last one we'll bother presenting is Rainbow Six Siege at 4K. Here we saw about a 4.4 FPS delta between Yestin and the AMD reference card from tests this week. That's bigger than some other games, but still amounts to only a 1.5% change. It's not worth worrying about the gaming performance when picking between these two. At the end of the day, as far as being a real video, you know, it's always fun to review these because it's different. I mean, this, the script is clearly very uh, all over the place, but that's what makes it interesting. But as far as being a real product, at according to Newegg right now, $70 over the official MSRP of $1,000, the launch MSRP of the 7900XTX, that is not that hefty of a markup for any kind of partner model. It's pretty common, you'll see like $1,050, $1,100, stuff like that. Uh, that's assuming it's still at that price when this review goes up. We don't know what it's going to land at by the time you see the review. But anyway, anywhere up to $1,100, or basically a plus or minus $1 to $200 from reference, uh, it starts to make sense if they can get you on the aesthetic side of it, but not from the performance side. You're not getting $100 of performance. You're not getting, definitely not getting $200 of performance. So you only buy this because you think it looks cool. This is not particularly good compared to the reference model. It's basically at best about the same. Now it has some advantages. So the GPU average temperature was better than the reference model, but the hotspot delta at 30 degrees over average, that's pretty dismal. Uh, so it's, is dismal a sliding scale? Can you be pretty dismal? It's dismal, <laughs> let's just commit to it, I guess. 30 degrees a big gap. And that is a result of the mounting mechanism where we think that in our pressure testing, we can always prove this stuff, but we think they should have some spring tension on the four screws here, and uh, that should help with getting the right tension on the uh, front of the, the actual GPU silicon from the cold plate. It also runs louder than necessary, so they could easily drop 3 dBA and get it a little bit closer to the AMD reference model without sacrificing any real thermal performance. We tested it quickly, and you're not going to notice a couple, like one to three degrees of GPU temperature. And even with the high delta for the GPU hotspot, it still doesn't push you anywhere close to throttle territory. What you will notice is 3 dBA. That is actually exactly sort of the start of a meaningful perceptible change to the human ear for a noise level difference. Another 3 dBA down is pretty big. Now, the clocks are also a little bit lower than reference. The second vBIOS pushes them higher. We think the second vBIOS on this card, they are wasting potential. They could be doing a lot more with it. And I don't know why, but companies have gotten incredibly lazy with their second vBIOS for this entire generation of GPUs, NVIDIA and AMD. Everything we've looked at, it's like it either doesn't work at all, and it's just a clone of the first vBIOS, it's, it's a backup that you don't need, or it's a, a poor execution of a quiet or an OC vBIOS. So in this case, they've, it's kind of the latter, where they have some features of a higher frequency OCV BIOS, but not all of them. Like the fan curve needs to be modified for one, and it should probably be pulling more power than an extra couple watts. It's a lost opportunity. The second switch on here, you might have noticed, I don't know if we talked about that in the teardown, but that's for a lighting toggle. I actually personally really like a toggle, a physical toggle switch for lights, because it means you don't have to install a bunch of garbage software. So that's actually an awesome quality of life feature. Overall though, even though we have some critiques that we just went through, it's, it's a real card. And it performs at least uh, equivalent in most places to the reference model. And the reference model that we had was fine. We didn't have one of the ones with whatever that vapor chamber defect was. Um, but certainly it's better than the ones that had the defect. There's no question about that. So. Uh, I guess that's it for this review. Let us know what you think. This is definitely something you buy mostly on the looks uh, and maybe you're doing some kind of cyberpunk or cool purple blue themed build. The front of this card might look good if it's vertically mounted with the front facing out or if you're building a, a gift for someone who might like this. So anyway, as far as the hardware goes, we think they've done fine with executing it. So if you're in the market for the looks, at least you know that functionally they haven't really sacrificed a whole lot. Other than the mounting pressure, that could be better, but it wasn't it wasn't 
uh, it wasn't ruinous to the performance. So that's it for this one. Thanks for watching. As always, subscribe for more. You can go to store.gamersnexus.net to help us out directly or patreon.com slash gamersnexus. And we'll see you all next time.